So, by popular demand, aka a quick vote beforehand, everybody seemed to want to hear a little bit about the Cassini mission. So, that is the presentation that we will deliver this evening. My usual ad, of course, at the beginning of the evening, uh, the York University Observatory is open. In fact, as we speak, my team is working diligently showing people the night sky because it's clear outside at the moment. But every Wednesday night of the year, except between Christmas and New Year, you have the opportunity to visit the observatory and have a look around the night sky with the observatory team. You can join us on Monday nights online with our public viewing uh, experience live to the web. And of course, that marries up with our York Universe radio production on astronomy.fm. So there are lots of ways for you to tune in York University and its observatory activities. We have two telescopes for your viewing pleasure. One is a 40 centimeter Mead LX200, as well as a uh, regular traditional Cassegrain telescope, 60 centimeters in diameter. It has its 50th birthday next year, big shindig. And in fact, to celebrate the, uh, the 50th anniversary, we're gonna go out and buy a new telescope. And in fact, a one meter class telescope will be on the York campus approximately this time next year. So you'll be able to have a look through that one too. Okay, oh, well, that's out of date, forget that. Right. Planets. Lots of planets in our solar system, and I probably shouldn't move around because that's going to annoy the heck out of the photographer. I'll not move quite so much, sorry. Uh, planets in our solar system, of course, the definition of a planet all changed in 2006. We're not going to go through all that level of excitement, but all of the differing planets in our solar system have undergone significant change, at least from our understanding of them, uh, over the last 30, 40 years. Since the introduction of spacecraft and flying to those planets, either in flyby missions or indeed into orbiting configurations, our appreciation of the characteristics of both the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, as well as the Jovian worlds, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. All of that information has changed in a very, very dramatic way since the uh, advent of spacecraft. Of course, Jupiter at the moment has a spacecraft in orbit, Juno, and we've all been witness to those wonderful images. We're getting very comfortable with them. But over the last literally 13 years, we've been regaled by wonderful imagery from the Cassini spacecraft. Now, Cassini went to Saturn with the expressed intention of literally rewriting the textbook on Saturn, and that is exactly what it did. Just a little bit of background on Saturn. We have actually known about this planet for a long, long time. It's one of the visible planets, one of the other five that we've been able to monitor pre-telescopically for literally hundreds, indeed thousands of years. Some of the earliest known observations date back nearly to 700 BCE. This is always a little on the slow side. It's changed its... Am I still on the air? I guess I am. I shouldn't even turn. Okay. Right? Okay. Uh, it, it's not always been referred to as Saturn. It's had an interesting uh, sort of nomenclature history, moving its way from Saturnus, and in fact, even prior to that, uh, you know, it, it's uh, associated with Kronos. Bottom line to it is, though, today you and I recognize planet number six from the Sun as Saturn, and it is arguably one of the most beautiful objects you could ever observe. But it wasn't until the advent of the telescope that we really began to appreciate how unusual this planet was. And some of the earliest observations, of course, not surprisingly, by Galileo. He, the imagery there you see just to the right of Galileo. It's some of the earliest drawings by Galileo as he looked at Saturn. And he, in fact, referred to it as sort of the planet with ears. Okay, And you can sort of understand that, a Mickey Mouse type imagery. Uh, but at that point in time, in sort of the early 1600s, the notion of a ring structure was quite foreign. So it was not Galileo who coined the term rings, but it was rather left to Cassini later in the mid-17th century to suggest that there were a ring system around the planet. And of course, we now know of the Cassini division, which is a seemingly empty region of material inside the ring structure. Uh, and then, of course, a little bit later on with Huygens. So there was a lot of activity in the 17th century as astronomers began to probe the notion of planet number six. And of course, Cassini, Huygens, they have all become very, very important as far as uh, you know, spacecraft uh, lore is concerned and the planet Saturn.
Some of the generic information about this planet, it is the second largest in our solar system, second only to Jupiter, has an entourage of well over 60 satellites, many of them very, very small, but of course one notable exception, that is Titan. It is the second largest satellite in the solar system and the only other satellite to have a significant atmosphere and of course to have a liquid residing on its surface. More about that shortly. I'm going to sort of spin along here because most of you are somewhat familiar with Saturn in contrast to the BMO retirees who <laughs> I had to sort of clarify that for. Uh, as Saturn moves once around the sun, takes about 30 years, it goes through this sort of interesting rocking motion. If it's making you nauseous, just look away. Uh, but this is a period of 15 years or thereabouts. And this rocking motion, the apparent change in the aspects of the ring system from our perspective is one purely of geometry. That is to say, the Earth's orbital plane compared to Saturn's orbital plane are slightly inclined. And of course, the ring system moves with that geometry throughout its orbital period around the Sun. And so you end up with this rather intriguing appearance. We're looking at Saturn every 15 years when the rings go edge on, you really do appreciate how thin the ring structure actually is. Of course, getting to Saturn is not easy. Uh, over the last sort of 25, 30 years, NASA has undergone all sorts of budgetary challenges, shall we say, and as a result of those challenges, getting spacecraft with capability to distant objects was a bit of a challenge. We probably all will remember the exploits of the Galileo spacecraft going out to Jupiter, to get out to Jupiter, we sent Galileo inwards towards Venus for a terrific flyby to pick up a little bit of energy, but in the process probably cooked some of the lubricant that then jammed the high gain antenna so it never deployed. So there are challenges in going the wrong way in the solar system. Fortunately, Cassini did follow a similar trajectory with a number of differing gravitational assists launching in 1997 finally arriving at Saturn in 2004, but it arrived intact. This was a significant spacecraft. It had basically a billion dollar price tag, uh, but it was not the first, of course, to actually get to Saturn. We had gone there previously with Pioneer 11 and then the two Voyager probes, all in the late 70s, early 1980s. And so our first glimpse of the Saturnian system came, uh, from an up close and personal perspective, came with those spacecraft. Now, of course, Pioneer didn't have a terrific onboard camera system, but the Voyager imagery was probably some of the first images of Saturn that you ever saw from a spacecraft, and they truly were tantalizing. You know, it was there that we realized that Saturn was a world worthy of exploration. The ring structure was far more complicated than we had ever dared believe. The number of satellites and their characteristics, particularly Titan, all demanded a return visit. And so it was very shortly uh, after the arrival of the Voyager spacecraft that work began in earnest on getting Cassini launched. When it comes to spacecraft missions, you've got to think in terms of decades. Cassini finally was launched in 1997. It was nearly 20 years worth of literally blood, sweat and tears that got us to that launch date. So people started talking about the Cassini spacecraft as Voyager was en route to Saturn and it really took a lot of effort to get the spacecraft configuration as we wanted it. And then of course, as I said, it took seven years to get there and then it operated for 13 years. You put all that together and the time span of the Cassini mission is 40 years and counting at this point in time. So some people literally have done nothing with their careers except Cassini. Now that's great as long as the mission is successful, but you know, if it's not, think of those graduate students. Oh, it's really, really a gamble. Okay, so some of the imagery from Voyager, you can see the detail that Voyager was able to deliver from not only the ring structure, and you can see in the top right how thin the rings are. They are huge in extent, literally hundreds of thousands of kilometers in width, but their thickness is measured in tens of meters in some places up to a few kilometers, but generally speaking, tens of meters thick. So it's a very, very shallow, rock and ice mixture sitting in the equatorial plane of Saturn. 
more about Voyager. As I say, I will move along because a lot of these you will be very, very familiar with. The top right hand image there, of course, is false color. This was the uh, trajectory that took Cassini from its 1997 launch to its 2004 arrival, a number of differing flybys. We do that, by the way, not just because we want to lengthen the mission and sort of you know, increase the PR value, but we do this to grab free energy. Instead of sending the spacecraft with a lot of fuel, because scientists dislike the fuel because it is there at the expense of payload, science payload. So we put more payload on board the spacecraft and then we utilize the gravity assist, if you will, interplanetary billiards by bouncing the spacecraft off a variety of gravitational fields and continue to add energy and move the spacecraft in differing directions. So instead of trying to redirect with fuel, we redirect the spacecraft's trajectory as a result of these gravitational assists. So this does look a little bit of a complicated process, but the net effect is greater science payload at your destination. And as I say, in this particular instance, Cassini arrived completely intact and fully functional. Give you a bit of perspective here of how big the spacecraft is, or was, I guess is a, perhaps a, a better term. Here it is. And of course, then we've got the uh, Huygens probe down here. Huygens was a uh, hitchhiker that was uh, put on board Cassini, courtesy of the European Space Agency. All space missions in this day and age are collaborative ventures. Even though NASA was the, the prime agent associated with Cassini, it had an international team working on the variety of differing science experiments. And the same statement applies to uh, Huygens from the European Space Agency. But e ESA is often credited with Huygens because it was the prime uh, deliverer of that particular probe. So Huygens went on with Cassini uh, sort of utilize the power on board Cassini and then eventually in uh, July, sorry, January of 9th, I'll get it right at the moment, January of 2005, Huygens was tossed overboard and its prime mission was to Titan. The other interesting aspect of this mission is it was a dynamic orbit. When we've launched spacecraft over the years to uh, Venus and to Mars in particular and even to Jupiter, the orbit that the spacecraft settled into was fairly um, unique, shall we say. That is to say, we only trimmed it a touch once it went into orbit. Uh, and it settled into its science orbit. There was often a little bit of maneuvering to get it from its initial orbit into its science orbit. Once it was in the science orbit, the spacecraft tended to be at a certain uh, distance from its planet, and it continued to utilize that same basic orbit throughout its mission. Starting with the uh, Magellan spacecraft, however, in uh, the early 1990s, as it was orbiting Venus, we began to uh, work with aerobraking type activities where we could actually change in a very significant way the orbit associated with a spacecraft. And then that gave NASA and the engineers another inspirational idea. Instead of using aerobraking, maybe we can utilize some of the gravitational assists of the larger satellites about which the planet, uh, about, utilize the gravitational assist of the satellites around the planets that the spacecraft is orbiting. So in this particular instance, Titan in particular was utilized as something referred to as a, as a gravitational anchor, and the Cassini mission orbit kept changing. And so no two orbits for Cassini were ever the same. And every time it passed by one of the smaller moons like Dione or Enceladus, Rhea, again, they redirected the spacecraft onto a new orbit and therefore a new set of science destinations. So as you can see here on the right, it was a very, very dynamic orbit and again, a very, very successful uh, undertaking that just increased the science payload or payoff, if you will, for the Cassini mission. All right, there's lots and lots of photographs I could have shown you associated with the Cassini mission. So seeing I'm the guy talking, I've got my favorites and take it up with me at the pub afterwards. <laughs> this is to me one of the best images that Cassini ever took. It's taken while it's in eclipse mode. That is to say the sun is on the direct opposite side of Saturn uh, as Cassini is taking this image. And you can see in lavish detail 
the ring structure. And you can see the extent. Remember I said it's hundreds of thousands of kilometers in diameter, wafer thin. This is the traditional ring system here, the so-called A, B, and C rings that we thought represented, quote, the complexity of the Saturnian ring system for centuries. You can now see that even the traditional region is broken up into many, many fine ringlets. But look at the extent that the ring system has. We didn't know about all of this extent until Cassini. And so this is really, really fine material, much finer than the rockier material in here. The debris that make up the ring system tends to be a few centimeters in diameter, up to a few meters, not much more than that. But this stuff out here is almost powdery in size. So very, very uh, complicated ring structure. And then you can see sort of you know these uh, bursts of material being pushed further out. The actual um, uh, cloud top of Saturn, because you're not really seeing any surface, the surface that you and I would think of, rocky material, is buried tens of thousands of kilometers deeply inside Saturn. So if you've got the diameter of Saturn being, give or take a bit, of, about 110,000 kilometers or thereabouts, the core, which we theorize, because we can't see it, but the core we theorize is about 20 to 25,000 kilometers in size. So 110,000 go on down a long way until you find the rocky core. So when you see Saturn in a telescope, or when you're orbiting about it, you're actually looking at the cloud tops. The cloud tops are made up primarily of hydrogen and helium with liberal smatterings of methane and ammonia and a few other fairly complex hydrocarbons. But this material here is all gas. At the cloud top, it is literally gas. It's at a balmy minus 150, 160 degrees Celsius, but it is basically gas. But as you disappear into the atmosphere of Saturn, you end up with an increasingly dense region, and eventually that gas becomes sort of a liquid layer, so you end up with a liquid hydrogen and liquid helium layer. And right down beneath that still further, you end up with uh, a mixture of sort of uh, icy materials, uh, primarily water, but with a liberal smattering of ammonia and methane. So it's a very, very complex atmosphere, and not what you and I normally are thinking about when we are talking gaseous atmospheres, as in the terrestrial planets. Oh, and over here, aurora activity, a key signature that tells you that there is a magnetic field associated with Saturn, which of course interacts with the charged particles from our solar wind and gives rise to the same sorts of aurora borealis or aurora australis that we have here on Earth. <coughs> One of the best advantages of a spacecraft that is in orbit around a planet is it can monitor change. Flybys, if you're lucky, pick up a few weeks worth of data associated with the planet that it is flying by. But when you go into orbit, now you can sit there and watch the seasonal changes. Or, as in this particular instance, the development of very, very significant structures, uh, atmospheric structures. So watching from a very close vantage point for a long period of time gives you a far greater understanding of what's happening in this particular instance in the planetary atmosphere or if you're in orbit around say uh, Mars then you are obviously able to watch the seasonal changes on the surface of the planet. Big advantage compared to flyby missions. Another one of the best images, this is the South Polar Hexagon, uh, false color in this particular instance. So you're looking down into a vortex, a circulation at the South Polar region. Uh, what is generating the shape of it, the hexagonal shape, lots and lots of my colleagues in the hydrodynamics region uh, field are trying to you know, map out the wind flows and the shears that generates the hexagonal uh, structure. In, theory, in, in theoretician circles, if you add enough variables, you can make anything do anything. But the real answer is they don't know why it's a hexagonal shape. But it is nonetheless a significant feature on Saturn, one that we weren't really able to see from Earth because it's in the polar region, but its longevity rivals, we suspect, the uh, great red spot on Jupiter. Now, we haven't been monitoring it for nearly that length of time, but it has been there throughout the uh, time of the Cassini mission. 
Again, the ring structure, here you see the wonderful detail, the ringlets, literally hundreds of ringlets with these small particles being corralled by the uh, shepherding moons. Remember I said there are about 60 odd uh, satellites orbiting around Saturn. They get together in pairs and they corral the ring particles and they maintain this wonderful structure over long periods of time. This is the Cassini division. It's not nearly as empty as we had first thought from Earth. It's just that it is less dense, if you will. Uh, it is not devoid of material, but it is certainly less dense than the rest of the ring structure. And then this was taken just before the end of the Cassini mission earlier this year. I draw your attention to this area here. So this is the B ring with all of its ringlets. The sun is up here somewhere, so it's casting its light across the edge of the B ring. And you see all of the shadows that are being cast here? This material is literally several kilometers tall. That is to say, material from the B-ring seems to get to the edge of the B-ring and then it just piles up into sort of like what you and I do when we shovel snow off our driveway onto the edge uh, in January and February. And it just piles up here and it casts these wonderful shadows. No idea why it's doing that. But uh, it really is a fascinating type of structure on the B-rings. And remember I said the, the ring structure can only be in places tens of meters thick these are peaks that are several kilometers. So, very, very unusual. Okay, and I did indicate to you that it was the shepherding satellites, the smaller ones that might only be a few tens of kilometers in diameter, that get together and help maintain the appearance of the ring structure. The rings have basically maintained its structure for the 400 years we've had telescopic observations of Saturn. The ring structure is probably many tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of years old. Whether or not it's original to Saturn's formation, the jury is still out. I think you would find that most people are of the view that it is not original. That is to say, it is, has formed, come and gone over the various millennia uh, associated with Saturn's existence. Of course, it was formed 4.5 billion years ago. The ring system, we believe, forms when small satellites, asteroidal material, falls deeply inside the gravitational field of Saturn and then literally tidal forces disrupt and pull the material apart. Think of Comet Schumacher-Levy 9 from the mid-1990s and the effect Jupiter had on the original on the original comet. When that material then sort of spreads its way around the equatorial plane, then it is up to the ring, uh, to the uh, small satellites to corral and maintain the ring structure. So all of these differing rings are corralled by a variety of differing satellites, not just the small ones, sometimes the larger ones as well. Gives you a bit of a feel. Lots and lots of the small stuff. The big guy here, Titan, that we'll talk about in a moment. And then about half a dozen modestly sized, as in a few hundred kilometer in diameter, uh, satellites. And courtesy of Cassini, all of these have been visited on multiple occasions. Uh, Titan, something like over 100 times uh, throughout the 13 years. But all of them were visited. So we now know a lot more about them. Our friendly neighborhood Death Star, Star Wars reference, it's actually called Mimas, but this crater here is fully a quarter of the diameter. It was first seen by the Voyager spacecraft back in the late 1970s, just after the beginning of Star Wars. Uh, and I think you will agree, it does bear some resemblance to the Death Star. Uh, and then some of the other satellites here. Notice all of them reveal the intensity of cratering activity. If you go from Mercury all the way out to the satellites around Neptune, the same story is told with respect to the intense bombardment that was taking place all across the solar system in those formative years just after the sun fired up its nuclear furnace. Lots and lots of activity of material being thrown around the solar system, finally settling into the asteroid belt, to the Kuiper belt, out to the Oort cloud and so on. But in that first five, six, seven hundred million years, yes, the solar system was a very dangerous place. And you see that record written continuously on the bodies of the solar system. Perhaps one of the biggest surprises of the Cassini mission was the satellite Enceladus. Okay? Here are the famous tiger stripes. 
this is a real image, by the way. This is not Photoshop. Okay, so what we've got here is water geysers back actually powering out of the South Polar region out through these tiger stripes, making it look as if Mimas is under you know, ion propulsion. It's not, of course. Uh, but this is salt water. Okay, that is to say water with uh, dissolved salts. Cassini literally tripped over this by flying through the plume and sort of saying, hey, what was that? Uh, and then we look back at um, Enceladus and took all of these rather amazing images, keeping an eye on this 400 kilometer diameter satellite. We now are of the view that there is a very large subsurface reservoir of liquid water. And of course, it is being maintained in that liquid state courtesy of the, uh, the tidal forces that are being exerted on it, primarily by Saturn, but by some of the other satellites in orbit around Saturn, keeping the interior just warm enough to keep the ice in a liquid state. Whether or not it's a complete subsurface shell or whether or not it's a, a, a significant cavern that is beneath the surface, we don't know. We've certainly done a lot of gravitational mapping of uh, Enceladus, courtesy of Cassini, so we do have some strong feelings about what the interior does look like, but you can only, so, you can only tell so much from gra this type of gravitational probing. But nonetheless, this was a huge surprise. Ah, I did have an image of it. So this is sort of one of the models uh, where there is a lot of uh, you know, uh, outgassing from the interior, which is pushing the material into the uh, cavern, and then it squeezes out through the broken tiger stripes on the surface. And you can see there are a number of differing geysers here. As I say, arguably one of the biggest surprises of the entire Cassini mission. We made it a point of visiting Titan on many, many occasions. Voyager uh, 1 went by Titan with the express view, courtesy of Carl Sagan, to have a really close look at the subsurface environment. And when we got there, we found out that it was completely cloudy, okay? So you could not see through the haze of Titan. The atmosphere is primarily nitrogen, good smattering of carbon dioxide, and then methane. We had detected very long chain organic molecules, tholins and so on, in the atmosphere. And Sagan wanted to get a really good look at all of that. But as you can see, this was not good. So this time when we went back with Cassini, we were planning to throw a spacecraft by the name of Huygens through that cloud deck and you know, map out the surface environment from beneath the clouds. And then, of course, Cassini maintained a series of flyby missions, radar mapped through the clouds, and literally monitored this particular satellite for most of the 13 years that it was in orbit. So this is an imagery that has been developed by the radar images, okay? Uh, and these regions here are lakes, lakes of liquid methane. Okay, so here's Huygens being thrown overboard, and it goes down under parachute canopy. It takes about two hours to descend from the cloud tops to the surface, taking science measurements and instrumentation flying in every direction for that entire two hours while it is under parachute canopy. It was an amazing success. Uh, lots and lots of data came back. We never anticipated the spacecraft would survive its landing. Well, guess what? It did. Oh, oh, well, we'll talk about that one in a minute. There's the landing image. Because we weren't expecting it to survive the landing, the camera couldn't move. So we have about 30 or 40 photographs of that. Okay, Just one of those little things. We also detected that it landed in a soggy material, wet sand, if you will. So as we were coming down under canopy, we were detecting precipitation, methane precipitation, so it's raining on Titan. This is the Lake District. This is Lake Ontario. I kid you not, Lake Ontario exists on Titan. This is a few tens of kilometers in diameter. The lakes are at a balmy minus 180 degrees Celsius, okay? But nonetheless, the environment, the atmospheric pressure, it's about one and a half times uh, Earth's atmospheric pressure, and given the temperature, it allows methane to retain its liquid state 
all across the surface. And so all these little dark things that you see here, they're all lakes. The differing topography on Titan, not only lakes, but we have seen sand dunes, we see small mountain ranges. You know, all of the sorts of geography that we see here on Earth really does have a counterpart on Saturn, uh, sorry, on Titan, but at a temperature that is 180 degrees below what you are used to seeing those geographic, those geologic features. Here, these rocks that you're seeing are primarily ice, but at minus 180 degrees, it has the uh, consistency of concrete. Uh, these are, for scale, a few centimeters to a few tens of centimeters in size. And as I said, we did land on sand that was obviously soaked with methane. So very, very interesting world. The cloud cover never leaves Titan, so you can never see through the clouds at optical wavelengths. You have to rely on radar imaging. So enticing has the Cassini mission shown Titan to be that there is active consideration for the next mission to Titan to be a boat. And they would dump it in one of the lakes and let it sort of paddle around the place. Uh, it's up against the idea of several flying drones, okay? Everybody loves drones these days, and so they're seriously contemplating deploying drones into the Titan atmosphere. Biggest problem there, of course, is that if you want them to run by solar power, yeah, that's a bit of a problem. Cloud? Uh, anyway. Okay, so we finally, after 13 years and change of excitement from the Cassini mission, we're finally beginning to get to the point where the fuel is orbit exhausted. That dynamic orbit is not without some fuel expenditure. Not much, but after you do it for 13 years, your fuel tank does begin to get a little dry. Well, instead of just saying goodnight to Cassini and turning it off, because of the possibility of life on Titan, because of the possibility of life in Enceladus, the decision was made that we do not want to leave Cassini in a vulnerable state. That is to say, after who knows how many decades, potentially running into either Enceladus or Titan. It's a complicated system without power for the spacecraft. It could be gravitationally tugged hither and yon and eventually land, <laughs> crash, on one of those satellites. And so the European Space Agency basically said, we're not going to let that happen. Rather, we're going to deorbit Cassini at, oh, give or take a bit, 120,000 kilometers an hour into the atmosphere of Saturn and absolutely disintegrate it. Because, you know, w despite our best efforts and uh, the various uh, treaties which govern our sterilizing of spacecraft, microbes undoubtedly survived the trip to Saturn on Cassini and the 13 years in the harshness of space. So. The European Space Agency said, no, none of that, we're going to deorbit it. With making that statement, they then decided, let's send Cassini out with really quite a flurry. We'd been staying away from the ring structure all throughout the mission because, of course, you didn't want to destroy the spacecraft early on with some sort of you know, rogue piece of material. But now the European Space Agency became very emboldened, and they decided that the final orbits would be between the rings and the upper atmosphere of Saturn. Up until this point in time, we've gone nowhere near there. Now, for the final 22-odd orbits, we were going to fly between the rings and the upper atmosphere. And then as the spacecraft finally entered the atmosphere, it was going to be transmitting data about the upper atmospheric composition, literally up to the last millisecond of its capability. So, starting in around about April, of this year, that's exactly what they did. They re, uh, retuned the orbit, courtesy of Titan, started flying between the rings and the atmosphere. For the longest, well, not for the longest time, for the first orbit, we went through with the spacecraft's antenna facing forward. Think of it as a big shield, right? Okay, with all of the instruments uh, cowering behind the antenna, just in case it really was a crowded area in that region. Uh, and so we did very little science except sort of count the pings on the antenna during that first pass. There was just about no pings. Uh, and so everybody said, what? And the next time around, they sort of poked some of the instruments out, and nope, there was nothing there. And thereafter, the spacecraft flew with instruments forward all through that region. And so the 
data flow from that region for 20 odd orbits was really absolutely magnificent. This is an orbital depiction showing you what happened. So this was just before we changed orbits and then we transferred it in and the last 20 orbits were in this fashion. So we got a long way out, took nice panoramic images, and then we flew at sort of 70, 80,000 kilometers an hour right across the uh, cloud tops of Saturn. And as you can see, between the inner ring edge and the atmosphere. Saturn, uh, sorry, Cassini, by the numbers, it really was an exceptional mission. Whichever way you want to cut it, it did everything we wanted it to do and more. And as you can see why all, by all of these numbers, you know, it's not likely to ever be outdone in terms of the science return. We have not got anything on the books for uh, a return to Saturn yet. It takes, you know, as I indicated at the beginning, something like 10 to 20 years to plan these missions. It's sort of anywhere from five to 10 years to get it out there. There are a lot of concepts that are being thrown around at this point in time, but there is no mission destined for Saturn. So for those of us who have enjoyed the last 13 years, keep it fresh in your memories because we're not likely to replace it any time soon. Saturn, uh, sorry, Cassini's demise was on or about uh, September 15th, 16th or 17th, I can't quite remember now, but middle of September and it flew into the upper atmosphere of Saturn exactly on cue and it reached a speed of about 123,000 kilometers an hour. It, its last transmission was at about 7.45 in the morning. I remember watching it because, of course, Mission Control was broadcasting live. And literally, the spacecraft did exactly as intended. It transmitted up to the very last millisecond, giving data as it literally flew apart. Cassini at Saturn. Thank you. Okay, so any questions from that corner of the room? Yep, go for it. Thank you. I like that. That's good. <laughs> um, you, met, you show the uh, aurora. Yes. From, and the solar wind, obviously, getting there. Yes. Um, is there any radio astronomy signals like with uh, Jupiter? It's not nearly as noisy a planet as Jupiter. It does have a very small radio signature. Uh, so, you know... All of the gas giants have similar characteristics. All of them have magnetic fields. Uh, three of the four of them are giving off more heat and more energy in general than they're receiving from the sun. Jupiter is by far the noisiest of the, the uh, gas giants, uh, but Saturn does have a small radio signature and it does generate, as you saw, that auroral activity at both the North and South Polar regions. That was a, an image from the South Polar region, but both of the poles have had aurora detections. The magnetic field is oh, something like a quarter of the strength of Jupiter, so it, it, it's a pretty decent magnetic field. But it's uh, very extensive, and in the equatorial plane, like it would be in Jupiter, I guess. Uh, what, the, the magnetic field? The mag no, no, the, uh, say the radio, oh, the radio signature, yes, it is primarily confined to the equatorial plane, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Up here. We're concerned about uh, the possibility of, of the Cassini contaminating Titan. And what was done for the Huygens probe so that it wouldn't contaminate? There are uh, agreements in place where we literally sterilize the bejeebies out of these spacecraft before we launch them. And so every effort was made to minimize the microbial impact that was being carried by particularly the Huygens probe. It was a more dramatic, if you will, sterilization process that it underwent than Cassini. Uh, so you're, you're right, we probably cannot, well, we, we definitely cannot guarantee a 100% sterilization, but Huygens was put through a more significant, a more rigorous process to decontaminate it than was Cassini. Cassini was never anticipated to land on a planet or on one of the satellites, so it didn't have the same level of sterilization. But when it became apparent that both Titan and Enceladus were really intriguing worlds, ESA decided they weren't even going to make any sort of a risk there, and you know, they basically decontaminated the spacecraft by destroying it uh, during re-entry. But Huygens was much better done. Now, some, somebody else had a... 
Yep, thank you. <laughs> no, no. I wonder what is the um, mechanics that are responsible for the formation of the, the rings? Um, you mentioned the satellites. Right. But it's amazing that it's so thin and sort of relatively stable. Right. Could you give us more detail on the mechanics? So when you have, uh, a, say, a satellite that's, say, about 10 kilometers in diameter, when it passes deep into a gravitational well, the force on the leading side of the rock is stronger than on the far side of the rock. And so you set up a differential force across that object. Uh, and if you get so close to the planet, beyond what we call the Roche limit, then that differential force overwhelms the, the structural force that's holding the object together, and the object shatters. And the example that is often given is grab a hammer, grab an unsuspecting rock, and <laughs> beat the heck out of it. What happens, though, is those particles then spread out because they have their own level of momentum during the disruption, and fast forward, say, 10 million years, they eventually spread out fairly evenly in the equatorial plane. So they migrate to the equatorial plane because of the rotation around the planet, and literally the bigger pieces will bump into each other and they'll begin to shred, and you eventually just end up with particle interactions, the dynamics, the normal dynamics of a multi-body system creating smaller and smaller particles and then just spreading out further into a gravitationally stable environment. And so it just basically ends up being a sheet. And the thinner the sheet, the happier are the particles. It, it's sort of as, as simple as that. Okay, so Stan, you've got the microphone, so you put that somewhere and then <laughs> I'll answer the question. <laughs> Going back to the, um, the rings, uh, Maxwell, I think, was a guy who tackled that kind of problem early on in his career. And did he come up with that idea of the, the, the limit to where the, the strain would fragment? Uh, um, the Ro As I recall, the Roche limit preceded uh, Maxwell. Uh, he, um, I don't remember who did the math associated with the Roche limit. It might well have dated back considerably earlier than that because, of course, Newton was the first person who tried to put, well, he, he created the law of, he, he outlined the law of gravity uh, and the F equals gm1 m2 over d squared, which is in essence where tidal differential force comes from. Uh, so I suspect the Roche limit and the idea of tidal disruption preceded Maxwell. However, I really don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, while well, you're on that, <laughs> go for it. I, I just think you need to um, clarify uh, a little bit more about Maxwell. I assume that we're not talking about Rachel Ward Maxwell here. <laughs> Everybody knows, I think, Isaac Newton and some of the things that he did for science, but we may be a little bit less clear on Maxwell. Maxwell, in the middle part of the 19th century, was one of the principal physicists who actually put down the equations that govern the electromagnetic theory. And from that, he was able to verify, in fact, that electromagnetic disturbances, that light being an electromagnetic wave, a combination of electric and magnetic fields sandwiched together, moved through the, uh, through the universe at the speed of light. So Maxwell was quite pivotal. And in fact, he has a whole series of mathematical equations that bear his name, the Maxwell equations. But it basically governs the motion of electromagnetic activity. So, which is why I'm not certain that it was he who actually was working on uh, the Roche limit and tidal disruption. But he was a pretty clever kind of guy, so he might have been. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. <laughs> okay. Are we sort of... And that... Okay. Which is fine by me. I'm quite happy to give it to her. <laughs> <laughs>